Number one day is Thursday, August 21st. August 21st. August 31st. Wow. Already September. Can you believe it? And this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everyone for coming. I'm humbled and honored by your presence. So thank you so much. All right, what are we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously. Your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep them to what's on the slide for now. And then when we get towards the live charts or towards the end of the presentation, which I'll let you know when that is, then you can start asking about uh, anything. And then hold off on your stock picks until we get to the live charts. And that's just for your benefit. And also ask about one stock at a time and hit return. You can ask about as many as you want, obviously. And again, that's for your benefit to make sure I cover all questions or as many as possible for sure. Um, this is kind of a working title. I literally threw this in right as I was going live with the show. And it'll make more sense as we get into things. This is Flame Screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, getting back to the the working title of this, I guess, is, is becoming a successful trader by boiling down the trading psychology. And if you think about it, the greatest methodology in the world with the greatest money and position management in the world is useless without the proper mindset to follow. And that's why trading psychology is so important. About three years ago, I started working on a course on trading psychology. I ended up with 14 pages of a to-do list. So I scrapped it and realized it would take too long to cover it fully. But a lot of that research did find its way into trading full circle. And that's why trading full circle, the psychology portion is the biggest portion of the entire, biggest section, I should say, of the entire course. And I started once again working on this psychology project, and then it just keeps growing and growing and growing. But that's okay, and I'm just going to chip away at it to a point where if I feel like I have to shelf it once again, I will, because I want it to be comprehensive. But one thing I was thinking about, especially lately, is... How can it be boiled down? Now, now it's just like trading can all be boiled down to simply sell higher than you buy or cover lower than you short. And that's it. So in trading, when you find yourself plotting that 15th oscillator or trying to determine if it's a fifth of a third or a third of a fifth in your wave count, just look at the trend and study charts and figure out how could you get in that trend because the only way to make money on a trade is to capture a trend. And I just summed up trading there in a few random thoughts, and that's pretty much it. So how would you sum up trading psychology? Well, number one, it's making decisions and living with them, and that's probably – the easiest way to sum it up but in doing so you have to follow the process oh we're not there's no slide showing up yeah i was just rambling on a blank screen so as i said quite as i said a minute ago it's making decisions and living with them now this doesn't just go for trading this goes for for life. As I often say, making decisions is easy. Living with them is not. Making a decision to marry the most beautiful woman that I ever met was a pretty darn easy decision. Living with her is not. Hey babe, in case you're watching, I'm half kidding. The secret to trading is making better decisions, making better decisions to begin with. The secret to life is making better decisions 
to begin with. I was dating a girl who was married three times prior. Now, it probably would have been a bad decision for me to marry her for the, would have been her fourth time. So you have to kind of make decisions, make better decisions to begin with. And again, that goes for life and trading. So if you do make a better decision to begin with, then it makes that decision a lot easier to live with it. Now, if you think about the trading decision tree, as I've talked about quite often, you have to ask yourself, are conditions generally conducive to your methodology? And for trend trading, that should be pretty obvious. Is the overall market in an uptrend? Is the sector in, in an uptrend? Is the stock you're looking to trade in an uptrend? And for the slightly more advanced, is it making a transition in trend? Is it an early trend at the least? And ideally, you want as many pieces of the puzzle to fit. And in addition to the sector being headed in the right direction, you want to make sure that individual stocks within that sector are also headed in the right direction. And by the way, once you do find a setup, let's say you find a biotech, then you want to look at every other single biotech in your tradable universe to make sure there's not a stock that looks better, a sexy sister or a sexy brother, depending on your preference there. So if conditions are conducive and you've picked the best and left the rest, I know it's cliche, but that's all you have to do. Then trade. Now, what if conditions aren't conducive? Right now, for instance, conditions really aren't conducive. The market has gone absolutely nowhere for three months. The Russell 2000 is still technically in a bow tie sell signal down. And we'll take a look at all this in just one second. A lot of sectors are chopping back and forth. A lot of sectors are in downtrends. So what do you do? Well, if conditions aren't conducive and things are looking like a ledger cardiogram, then you have to ask yourself, do you think you have the mother of all setups? Something that could quite possibly trade contra or in lieu of the market, however you want to look at it. And right now, I think that's more speculative type of issues because they're not really worried about the earnings so much or fundamentals or the overall conditions in general. So if you do think you have the mother of all setups, then by all means, you should trade. But if you don't, what do you do? Well, walk away, but be okay. So again, trading like life is making decisions and living with them. And at living with them is the tough part, okay? So just realize that you might walk away from something that you thought looked okay, but it wasn't worth trading, and it could take off without you. Well, that's the danger of selective perception. And I know I've said this a thousand times, but you really have to be careful of this. And I'm guilty as much as anyone, You, especially when you look at as many stocks as I do daily. So I'll, I look at 2,000 stocks roughly every day. And obviously, one of those 2,000s will take off the next day. And one of those 2,000s might have even been on my radar for further analysis in my short list, my so-called Landry list. But if I decide that I'm not going to take the trade, then I have to live with that decision. And I can't watch it take off and get pissed off and say, well, Damn, I should have taken that trade. What you fail to realize is the other 100 trades that weren't so great, that were also mediocre setups that didn't work, and how many of those actually failed, and how much money you would have lost. So you have to walk away and be okay. Now, getting along the lines of making the decisions and living with them, it all boils down to following 
the process. And, and I was kind of thinking lately a way to kind of incorporate following the process into the making decisions and living with them. And that's kind of a little bit of what you're going to see today. And in following the process, you can't, that means not following your fear, your cravings. And by cravings, I mean cravings such as cravings for excitement, feeling like you have to do something, your emotions, or your ego. Now, there's a lot in that sentence there, a sentence fragment, I should say. So you need to follow the process, not your fear, your cravings, your emotions, or your ego. And that's going to make your decisions a lot easier to live with. In fact, on every decision you make, on every trading decision you make, is it out of fear? Is it out of cravings? Is it out of emotions or ego? Or is it simply out of following the process of what should be done? Now, I looked up process this morning, and according to Google.com's dictionary, they had the de definition I liked the most, as it applies to trading at least. And a process is a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. Now, here's a quote I came across. It's kind of a lengthy one, so we'll break it down, which I thought was pretty darn good. If you're excellent at what you do, in the stars that are in alignment, you win. Of course, you may run out of time first, but if you're excellent every day, you will have furthered your chances of beating the house as much as they can be. That should be your primary measure of success. Excellence, not simply the spoils that come with good fortune. You don't want to entrust your satisfaction and sense of fulfillment to circumstances outside of your control. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Instead, base them on the quality of what you do and who you are, not the success of your business per se. Understand, unless you understand what is truly outside your control, you are likely to make a serious mistakes, misallocate resources, and waste time comes from the monk and the riddle. Now, this morning, as I was thinking about what I want to talk about, I began looking at my little brainstorm mind map of what I was doing last week and a lot of things that I didn't actually, actually weren't able to fit in my presentation because I had so much material from last week. And I started working on this one particular quote. Well, there's a volume of information just in this one quote. There's a volume of lessons, more importantly, not so much information, but there's a huge trading lesson that goes off on, on many tangents, but it's all summed up in this one little paragraph. So I started breaking it down and be excellent at what you do. So find something that's conceptually correct. Now, conceptually correct is a term I got from Larry Connors back in the in the 90s because I was doing a lot of system research for him, and I was doing a lot of system research for myself, and a lot of my research would sort of find its way into his stuff. And every now and then I'd discover some kind of anomaly or something, and he taught me early on that it has to make some sort of conceptual sense. It has to be conceptually correct. And there are not there are a lot of anomalies that occur that are just sort of random longer term, although they might seem like they have some order into them shorter term. So conceptually correct means something like trading with the trend. And by the way, as I preach, the only way to ever profit from the market is to capture a trend. So in trading with a trend, maybe look for something like a very obvious trend and then look for something like a trend knockout. 
Well, a trend knockout is a sharp sell-off, and we'll take a look at one here in just one second, and I'll draw it on the, on the screen too, that knocks out some people that could have easily taken you out of the trade too. It also attracts eager shorts, and if that market begins to go up and triggers your entry in, then those eager shorts will be forced to cover. Now, shorts tend to have a bigger ego than longs, and their ego tells them that a market does not deserve its high justification, its justification at these high levels, I should say. The short's ego tells them that they should confuse issue the issue with facts, that they should interject logic into the equation. Logically, the market should not be this high. Okay, I should say they confuse the issue with facts. The issue is what is is. If a market is going higher, market's going higher. Doesn't matter what you or me, or the guy who screams on TV thinks about it. So something like a TKO is conceptually correct in one, it knocks out longs that could dump their position and take you out with them if you just blindly jump in, and two, it attracts shorts. It also, to some extent, knocks out the Johnny come lately's, which are the worst absolute traders, people who just jump in no, more, no matter what the price is. And they're, they're the first, they're the last in, but they're also the first out. And then they also come right back in a lot of times. Okay. A little beyond this presentation, but if you watch the TKO video under videos on my website, which you can click to in the home page, you'll get this whole uh, synopsis on that. So find something simple that's conceptually correct. And a good example of that, would again, would be TKOs and maybe persistent pullbacks, or ideally a TKO within a persistent trend. And by the way, just find one simple little pattern and trade that simple little pattern. If you can't be successful with one pattern, you're not going to be successful with a dozen patterns. And... Here's something that's kind of hard, but once you've been doing this for a while, you begin to realize, believe it or not, a mediocre system will win over a magical system in the long run. And if you think about a magical system, what they have done is curve fit the data. <laughs> I've been getting emails lately about, if you'd have just put $10,000 into this system, it'd be worth $4.5 million today. Well, if you read a little further or study a little further, you'll see that they didn't put $10,000 into the system and they didn't make $4.5 million on this system. But what they did instead was a few weeks ago, they wrote a system that looked in perfect hindsight and I'll be darned, it worked pretty good. Okay, well, hindsight's 2020, obviously. In theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. Yogi Berra said that. So beware of something that seems sort of magical because what they have done is curve fit the data. And if it's a bit, little bit more arcane or something that numerology or arcane that seems to have worked perfectly, well, the problem is it's not going to unfold like that in the future. And there's going to be some question over what to do. And it's like you can often ask people who follow it. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus because as I meet more and more people, I am beginning to learn that some people do use some stuff that seems kind of out there. But I think the only reason they're successful is they're successful when their trades correspond with the trend. So I don't want to go out there and be too much of a critic of them. But when they fight the trend, they lose. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is something simple and conceptually correct is going to be mediocre, okay? I'm kind of downplaying something like my stuff, like just following the trend and all. And it's going to be hard, okay? I'd make a lot more money if I tell everybody how easy it was. Well, in some ways, it is easy. Just find a few of these simple patterns and follow them. That's all you have to do. 
But keep it simple when you're looking for something. So here's our biggest trade of the year. I wish we had a few more of them, but and I'm working on it. We'll see if we can find a few more. But you can see this stock was at a pretty solid uptrend. Now, it's more impressive if you were just looking at, if you went back to 2016 and looked at the chart going back because it's made such a big run since. But as you can see, this was a fairly persistent trend in here. And also, we had a pattern called a double top knockout. Now, it did flatten out a little bit, as you can see right here. But that's okay. A double top knockout, what you're looking for is a market to come up and make kind of a short-term marginal double top. And ideally, I like this bar to be a little higher. And then you're looking for some sort of knockout type of move, something that would help to knock people out of the trend. And this double top knockout, the double top portion of it, helps to attract the eager shorts. And we got an entry on this. And then you put a stop in. And then you take partial profits. Okay. And that's half. And then you try your stop higher. And the secret sauce, as I often preach, is letting this stop gradually widen out. Notice how it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And yes, it will suck in the end. Okay. But so what? If you make 200% on a trade instead of making 240% or 30%, whatever the case may be, that's a decent trade, okay? And that's a whole nother lesson. But that's it. Keep, keep it simple. Simple money management, simple patterns, trading with the trend. And make sure it's conceptually correct. So be excellent in what you do. But it doesn't have to be that complex. Find something that's very simple and follow it. Now, by the way, it's hard not quitting or chasing shiny objects when things begin to go a little bit awry. And one thing that... I've always had a hard time wrapping my head around from day one is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. And since day one, when I've hit a string of losses, I've always questioned whether or not I'm losing it by continuing to follow the process. So that's provided, of course, you're doing the right thing to begin with. Now, that definition of insanity has kind of cursed me in some ways, but I finally wrapped my head around it and embraced it. But if you're over trading, trading in less than ideal conditions, trading out of boredom, which I guess is also over trading, if you're not honoring your stops, and all the other bad behaviors that if you've been trading for more than a few weeks, you know you're doing. Or if you if you don't, you can ask me and then I can tell you, then you can tell me that you, you already knew that, as I preached about ad nauseum. Then, of course, you, you are the epitome of the definition of insanity. You're expecting a different outcome. But my angle on this is, provided, of course, that you're doing the right thing to begin with, that's what trading often is. Getting stopped out, let's say, five times in a row, then catching the mother of all trends, which erases all those five losses and then some. Now, we've only had that one really big winner, not much else to speak of this year, and it's been, it's been kind of a tough year. And we're going to talk about the personal benchmark here in just one second. But... And, and I don't hate to use the word hope, but I feel fairly confident. I feel extremely confident over time. I feel extremely confident that I will be able to find more 
big winners. And I feel extremely confident that I will be able to do fine longer term. The problem is, I don't know what the timing on that will be. And that's something that people can't wrap their heads around. And it's hard for me too to say, well, I, I don't know when the next big winners have come along, but I know that I keep plotting along. So along the lines of time, and as was said in The Monk and the Riddle, it said provided, of course, you don't run out of time. Well, we have to make sure that we don't run out of time first before we become successful. So be excellent at, you, at what you do, but don't run out of time. Well, guess what? You can give yourself the gift of time. And it amazes me how much pressure people put on themselves to become successful in this business. And they forget how long it took them to become a doctor, a lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic, or a plumber, okay? You know how hard it is to become a plumber? It's really hard. I don't remember whether I told the story in Trading Full Circle or in one of these presentations. But we have a friend of the family, and, and he was in a very tough business, and one day he decided that he couldn't take it emotionally anymore. And for whatever reason, I don't know, but he decided to become a plumber. So we called him a couple months later to come fix an issue at the house that I had finally given up on. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm not a plumber yet. I thought you were a plumber. Well, no, I you have to become a journeyman and then you have to, there's a long process and you have to get licensed and take tests. Okay. Well, there's no barrier to entry in trading. If you have a few dollars in a computer, you're in business. And I find that I pick on doctors the most, but other professions are just as bad. But doctors, since there is such a long process in becoming a doctor, they tend to forget how long it took them to become successful as a doctor, and they don't give themselves time. Now, one of the things that I'm seeing is a reoccurring theme in studying all this trading psychology. And what I'm doing is I'm studying the trading psychology as it relates to me and my experience and the experiences that have been shared with me over the years through answering thousands and thousands of emails and working with thousands and thousands of individuals. And it, it's serving as much as kind of a reminder of everything as it is to kind of uh, epiphanies and such. And one, before I digress too far, one of the reoccurring themes that I've been seeing is that if you don't enjoy the process, then you shouldn't be trading. And that's one of my problems, I think, over the years where I've done people a disservice and I actually feel bad about it, is that I've encouraged people by telling them to do the right thing, even though they're not doing the right thing. At some point, the point I'm trying to make there is at some point, I need to explain to them that how long are you going to continue to not do the right thing and lose money? And you have to have a love for the market. You have to love the process. You have to be fascinated by the markets. And if you're not fascinated by the markets, then don't do it. We all get into this business for the wrong reasons. I got in for freedom and money. And I guess I do have some freedom because I am my own boss. But I ended up working... 10 times more or 20 times more than I ever thought I would. And then I have been able to do some wonderful things like travel the world and all. But it was a lot more different than it appears on the surface. And it appears on the Internet, at least now, you know, with all these idiots out there. Anyway, I don't want to digress too far. But I think the secret or one of the secrets, if there is one, is that you have to enjoy the process. And that's a reoccurring theme that I'm seeing over and over. Markets should be fascinating 
to you, okay? If you don't enjoy what you're doing, and this goes for life in general too, then find something else to do. So the point I was trying to make about, I guess stringing is a bad word, but stringing people along, tell them, you know, you can do it and asking them, okay, well, you didn't honor your stop, so next time honor your stop. It's just at some point you're going to have to decide whether or not you actually enjoy the process. And the process, part of the process is following the process. Now, you also have to make time to trade. Now, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth here. Well, once you have a methodology, it really doesn't take much time. I spent about 20 seconds this morning, if that much, putting in some orders. Okay? And now I'm going about my life, which is including, obviously, doing this presentation. But to get to the level where you're confident enough to place the orders and follow the plan, that will take time. And you can make that time. Somebody asked me a while back, Aaron, if you're in here, I'm talking about you. He said, what do you do if you don't have enough time to learn how to trade? Well, you have to make time. And what I said in his case was, or any case I should say, is to get up two hours early every day and study the markets when there's no interruptions around or anything. And do that until you feel confident in a methodology, until you feel confident enough to trade that methodology. Study what goes right, but also study what goes wrong. Being your own devil's advocate, as I preach, is vitally important. And if you're not willing to make that kind of commitment, then maybe you shouldn't be trading. Now, what I did was, and it didn't work out longer term, but I just want to show you the level of commitment, how serious I was, was I felt like I was giving my job, which I didn't like, my best hours. So what I started doing was, I started staying up all night and studying markets and doing research, and then I would go to work and work whatever hours I had to work, and then come home, sleep for a while, and then start the process over. Now, it didn't work. The reason it didn't work was I was young at the time, early 20s, and it was hard to try to have a social life and live that kind of life. And it was also hard because everyone else was sleeping when you're awake. It was just very hard to do that kind of work. And I was not able to stick with it. But I was able to find time longer term to where I felt like I could make the transition over to this career. So you're going to have to make time to become excellent at what you do. Now, you want to judge your success by your ability to follow the process. That's the reoccurring theme that I'm seeing over and over in all this reading on psychology. Douglas, Steenbarger, many, many others. And I guess I'm doing a disservice by not naming them all, but it would take me 10 minutes. Livermore. So you're going to have to measure your success by your own personal benchmark, whether or not you're following the process as opposed to how much money you made. Now, one way to do that is through honest postmortems. I can't emphasize this enough. After every trade, go back and look at it and not only look at the trade, look at the markets, look at the sectors. You have to look at it like you're seeing it for the first time. And if it's a biotech, go look at all the other biotechs, like I said earlier. And make sure you pick the best stock there was to begin with. Now, you have to be honest in your postmortem, and you have to kind of put yourself in the mindset that you're seeing it just for the first time. And guess what? You might not wish you would have taken the trade. And believe me, there's a lot of trades when I go back and look at it, I think, damn, I wish I would have taken that trade. But you have to be careful 
in that if it truly was a trade that you should have taken, then you did the right thing. Terrence O'Dean said, markets generate a lot of data, but they don't generate a lot of clear feedback. Outcomes are noisy. Good decisions may have bad outcomes. Bad decisions may have good outcomes. And here's a reoccurring theme I see over and over. And one thing I've been doing is reading some of these vintage books on trading psychology, and I'd encourage you to do the same. If you go on Google, a lot of them are in public domain, but I've actually found a lot of cases where I, I go back and get the try to get the actual book in some sort of uh, print form or text or something searchable, um, which you can find on Kindle and or you might go out and uh, maybe a rare book dealer you can find them from. So I try to get the actual text as much as possible. And a lot of things that I'm reading about today, such as what Mr. O'Dean said, is you go way back in time and they'll say the same exact thing. So it's like I'm trying to find the original source on a lot of these. And it might have been Livermore that actually said this first. Or if not, it was in the psychology of trading, which is back to the 1900s. But Mr. Dean gets the most recent credit by saying, we have a tendency to take credit for our successes while blaming our failures on bad luck or others. Well, you will have bad luck in this business. And that's one thing I can guarantee but you, you will also be successful in doing things that maybe you should not have done. And as I was putting my, together my presentation this morning, I was on an institutional project once and I, I presented a trade and I got ripped a new one for presenting that trade from a hedge fund manager. Well, guess what? The trade worked out really well. And I'm like, well, it worked, didn't it? And he said, well, you just picked up nickels in front of a bulldozer. I was like, okay, point taken, you know? So you might make a lot of money doing some stupid things, but that doesn't mean that you did the right thing. And that's kind of the perverse way trading works sometimes. And you may follow the process and not have a good outcome because outcomes can be noisy. In the reading of behavioral finance, I came across this quote, which I thought was pretty good. A rising tide lifts all egos. Last week or week before, I was talking about some things that had me concerned about this market. And we'll take a look at some of those in just a minute. And some of the non-quantifiable things were complacency. And I saw some guy on Facebook saying, no, oh, bear meat is, is tasty because he, he bought the market the day it went up. And then he claimed it wasn't just luck, that his system had bought the market all year on these dips based on whatever. And there were some flaws in what he was doing. It was one of those that'll work until they don't. And I started to explain to him why he needs to be careful. But then I realized experience must be the best teacher. So there's been this complacency that has occurred because the market has gone higher. And every single time it looks like it's rolling over, it's turned around and going right back up. Well, that'll work until it don't, as I often preach. Now, last week, and I just want to kind of skim over this quickly, but we talked about the fact that trading involves risk. And risk, by definition, means a potential to fail. And with that risk, there's a monetary risk and there's a psychological risk. And people often forget about the psychological risk. This one is fairly easy to quantify. You're going to risk 2% of your account per trade. And that's a number you want to work up to over time. You don't want to start tomorrow trading at 2%. Maybe start tomorrow at a quarter percent and become successful at a quarter percent and then go to half and then three quarters and then one and then one and a quarter. Just take your time. But the psychological part of risk can be really tough. 
when we lose money, it's painful. In fact, the pain of losing money, it's been proven, and this is another one of those psychological things I keep seeing over and over again. I don't know the original source, but it shows up a lot in these behavioral science books. The pain of losing money is actually more painful than if you were to rate the emotion scale. Let's just put it this way. It's a much bigger emotional response to lose money or fear of losing money than it is to, to make a gain. In other words, a $1,000 profit doesn't make you feel, on an emotional level, doesn't make you feel, it makes you feel good, right? But a $1,000 loss is 10 times more painful or whatever the number may be than a $1,000 gain. Hopefully that made sense. And I always come back to Douglas on a lot of these things. What you fear is not the markets, but rather your inability to do what you need to do when you need to do it without hesitation. Well, that goes back to be excellent at what you do and make sure you have defined your process and define something, again, simple and conceptually correct that you're going to follow and be able to do it. And you have to reach a point where there is no fear. Now, you know you can be wrong, but you have to embrace that you can be wrong. What's amazing is the longer that you're in this business, the more humble you become. I guarantee you, if you've been trading for a few years, you're not going to go on Facebook and write, bear meat is tasty. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to digress too far. So follow the process. You obviously want to pick the best and leave the rest. I know it's cliche, and I've actually figured out why people do this after talking with a psychologist, or a psychologist email me, I should say. A psychiatrist, I should say. We, as professionals... A lot of times we're forced to take whatever train wreck comes along. If you're a psychiatrist and somebody comes to you that's batshit, <laughs> you're going to have to take that patient. You can't sit around and wait for the perfect patient to come along. If you're an automatic transmission mechanic and somebody brings you a transmission and needs fixing, you can't just fix the ones that are going to be easy to fix. You have to take whatever comes along. In trading, you can't, you can't do that. You have to wait and wait and wait. So you need to pick the best, leave the rest, go through that trading decision tree that I showed earlier. And then, of course, you want to plan the trade. And then in planning the trade, you have to ask yourself, where will you be wrong? And... You have to accept it, as Douglas said, and many others too. You haven't fully accepted risk until you have a point where you will be willing to get out, be willing to be wrong. Sometimes I'll have trades where I'm giddy about them. I just know they're going to work, and I'll put them in a trading service, and they'll work splendidly splendidly and sometimes I'll make the mistake of saying well I knew that one would work and then my clients are like well why didn't you tell us it's like well because every now and then one that I feel like I know is going to work doesn't work so you have to fully accept that risk and you have to ask yourself where will you take profits if things go well and let's say the market rallies up following a simple little money management plan. You get in a trade, the market rallies up, it gets your initial profit target, goes up there, hits it, and then comes back in and implodes. You have to accept it if that's all the market has to offer. And as I preach, sometimes this will happen three and four times in a row. We'll just get a swing trade out and get scratched out in the remainder. And then, of course, everybody emails me, not everybody, but a lot of people, Dave, why don't we just take 100% here? Or even worse, Dave, you know what? I started taking 
as a swing trade profit because the market usually doesn't follow through. I don't want to give up that open profit on the remainder. Well, you're never going to make any real money if you don't stick with the trend longer term. So if it does hit that initial profit target and come back in, you have to accept that that's all there is. And you have to live with that decision. And you can't second guess it and say, damn it, I should have taken all of that profit. Well, if you do that on every trade, you're not going to make enough longer term and you will lose longer term. Now, on the flip side, you're going to have to accept it if there's much more. Now, we haven't had fantastic conditions in a while. But every now and then we'll have a few big winners like I just showed you. And we'll have that initial profit target in there. And we'll take the initial profit at that initial profit target. And the market will keep going. Okay? This is the ultimate goal, right? Well, I get a lot of emails. Well, why don't we just keep 100% on? And then a lot of people are like, well, you know what? I'm just going to keep 100% on. Well, longer term, you're better off taking that partial profit just in case it doesn't materialize. And if it does materialize, your position is big enough because your risk was a lot smaller back here and you took a, a size, a sizable position based on that risk. Well, you're still going to have a pretty nice position way up here. And guess what? If that market doubles or triples, then you have dollar wise, you have a pretty big position. On, OK. As far as margin is concerned, the amount of if you have to go in as a new position or if you want to look at the percent of that position in your portfolio. <laughs> So there's plenty enough risk, even at a half of a position. Now, in addition to planning that stop, how are you going to trail your stop? Well, as I've talked about before, I like to play some games, like keep the change. Like if the market goes up, let's say if it's a stock in the 20s and it goes up 30 cents, I'm like, eh, you know what, keep the change. I'm going to leave my stop where it is, and by doing that, my stop is widening out 30 since and then I like to see it also as kind of gaining ground. Let's say that a stock goes up three points in one day. I'm very lucky that it goes up three points in one day, or fortunate, I should say, not lucky, fortunate, probably be a better word. Then I might bump that stop two points. So I've gained a little bit of ground on the trade if stopped out, or I should say when stopped out. Now, once you've got this plan and once you've accepted this plan, then the only thing to do is turn off your screens and find something that's far more interesting to do. And it's hard. A stock's going sideways. You get in a stock, goes up, then it goes sideways, 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 weeks, months. Okay, but your stop's right here. It's not stopping you out. What do you do? Nothing. Go find something that's far more interesting to do. All right. Frenchie says the original is a rising tide lifts all boats. Yes, I'm, I'm aware of that. I just assume that everybody knew that's the original saying. So and Frenchie's point is that if the market is headed higher then a rising tide lifts all boats. And also I've said before, if a market is selling off, then a sinking tide sinks all boats. So that's something to also remember. No. Uh, Steve says, have you considered raising the stop incrementally at the stock basis for a long time, the value of money and loss of trend? No, 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 no. I mean, if you get into a move, a longer term move, and it goes up 200% in one year, so what if it went sideways for a few months? Okay. I mean, that's, that's no big, I don't, that's a, I know it seems, you know, doing what feels right is often, not the thing to do. Doing what feels good or feels logical is often not the thing to do. So here we have a stock that's going up 266%, okay? Probably 250% since the entry. And less than one year. Now, I don't want to annualize it out because that's going to change things. 
But that's a pretty damn good return on your money. But notice that it did sideline in here for one, two, nearly three months. So for three months, that was dead money. Well, how much money are you going to make on your money in three months? I don't know. What's interest rates? 1% a year? <laughs> you know, you're going to make some pennies on that? You're going to trip over the pennies while going for the dollars? No. You're going to follow the plan. You're going to follow the system. But Dave, what if you sit in something for three months and you stop out? So what? Go find another one like this. Okay? I'm working on it. You should too. But yes, what feels good, what feels right, which makes sense, is to get out when it seems to become dead money. And no, you don't want to tighten your stop because a lot of times you might just have one little knockout move. And let me show you something here real quick. One pattern that I often talk about, and it's something I don't trade off of, but if you had to, I think it would be conceptually correct. I think it would test out. Let's say a market is in a base. Sometimes it'll have a big thrust down and then come right back up. And when it takes out the top of that base, if you were to trade just off this pattern, I think you'd do okay. Okay, It's not something that I want to rush out and do because I have a methodology in place. But I have observed this enough empirically, I guess that's being redundant, to know that that's something that you could probably trade. So if you say, okay, well, my trail will stop up here. Wait a minute, this is becoming dead money. So I'm going to go ahead and tighten my stop up. You're going to get knocked out of that trade possibly right before it takes off. Now let me throw an adage in here. A market will often do what it has to do to frustrate the most people. And the corollary to that is, as I say quite often, a market will often do the obvious in the most unobvious manner. So let's say this stock is in a longer term uptrend and then it starts basing. Well, the obvious move here would be to continue higher because the longer term uptrend is still in place. And maybe, or hopefully, you know, you hate to use the word the hope, I know. You hate to use the word hope, I know. Let me try to say that in English. But you're hoping that that longer term trend will continue. But what the market will often do is have one last shakeout before it takes off again. And that shakeout could be through manipulation. So what? I don't care how it's done or why it's done. If it works, it works. So I think you're going to knock yourself out of a lot of good trades by doing what feels good or feels right. Or makes a hell of a lot of sense. And then the other corollary to that other adage would be the market will often do what it has to do to fool the most amount of people. So if that market is going to head higher, it'll shake out first. And I got those from Linda Raskin. and she said she probably got them off the floor. She didn't claim them. Winter is coming, and the question is, has it been delayed? Maybe so. I hope so. Well, as I often say, it's better to be safe than sorry. Now, we didn't go out and do a lot of shorting. In fact, we didn't do any shorting. But we kept an eye out for shorts. And we made a decision whether or not we're going to take them. And we didn't. And we just paid attention to what's going on in the markets. And we got really selective on the long side. We went weeks without making trades. And that's before we even had these signals in the market was dubious. Just because the market was going sideways. So a lot of times it's better to be safe than sorry. Phil says, so if it has to not make a hell of a lot of sense, does that mean we have to make nonsense moves? Uh, 
Well, I guess I guess I could get tripped up between conceptually correct and logical or making sense. But to sit in a stock that's not moving when you're a trend trader makes no sense whatsoever. But if you're already in that trend and you're following the plan, then that makes a hell of a lot of sense. Because let's say you get out of that trade and that's going to be your new rule to get out of the trade. Well, when are you going to get out? After the third day of no action, after the third week of no action, after the third month of no action? And I think the market, again, as I often preach, can be a really bad teacher. Because maybe maybe nine out of ten times that dead money, taking that taking the money off the table is the thing to do when the market was basic. But that one trade that's gonna make your entire year would be missed if you tried to interject that type of logic and reasoning into the market. So I, I don't know exactly your point, Phil, but I think that just to kind of twist it around a little bit, doing the hard thing is the thing to do sometimes. The easy thing is to say, you know what, I'm just going to get out of this so I don't have to worry about it. I made my little whatever. Let's say I made 50. You say, let's say you make 50 percent. Well, you made 50 percent of a trade to get out and market goes sideways for three months afterwards. You feel pretty good, good about that. But then it takes off and it goes up three or four hundred percent. But Dave, how often does that happen? Not often enough, but often enough. How's that? Well, I may let me rephrase. I wish it happened more often, but it happens often enough. And we come back to giving yourself time. You have to chip away at it week after week, month after month, year after year, until those big moves do come along. <laughs> Get it. Just checking you were speaking English. Yeah, I mean, that's the paradox or however you want to look at it when it comes to trading. Sometimes it's sometimes you could say things and it, it sounds like you're talking about both sides of your mouth. Once again, it's here. I guess I need to stop saying that because it's been here. <laughs> the trading full circle course. A lot of, uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of the proud of the whole thing but there's a lot of good information just in the first few videos and I would encourage you to watch them especially if you've never traded before or if you've traded and hit some bumps in a road or even if you just want to broaden your knowledge and kind of go back in and think about things from the utmost essence and how markets work and again we're not trading Traders, I'm sorry, we're not trading markets, we're trading traders. And that's the hard thing to wrap your head around. And it's kind of interesting. You go all the way back to Livermore, and I can't think of the quote exactly. Or maybe it was in that trading psychology book from the 1900s. It was talking about how what makes a market is the collective of all the participants. And more importantly, it's the collective of the participating participants, those with the those with the money or the most money, not the it's not a consensus. Obviously, it's the whoever has the most amount of money and is betting on the market is what's going to make that market move. Anyway, check it out. Videos are free. There's a link right there. You can get off my homepage too. All right, let's hop into the – any other questions on any of this? And I'll be happy to come back to slides if you want. Uh, quick announcements. I'm still rolling out the learning management system. Right now, that's been rolled out with Trading Full Circle. And anything else I do or redo will go into that. I will eventually redo all courses, such as the IPO course, stock selection course, et cetera. And it, go, it will go into the learning management system. The learning management system, it's kind of like taking an actual course, a physical course. You actually have to complete a section, take a test, then you take the next section. I know, wow, that's exciting, huh? But, you know, you'd be surprised at how much more you'll learn that way. I've had people over the years buy courses and never use them. I don't mind if you do that. That's fine with me. 
But if you're going to do that, don't ask me questions and expect me to explain everything to you because, one, I'll think there's something wrong with you because I think you're mentally incapacitated because it's all in the course and somehow you're not getting it. Well, what I find out is a lot of times I'll say, why don't you, do you not get this or something? Is something wrong with you? Have could you rewatch the video? Well, I haven't watched it yet. It's like, okay. Well, now I can tell whether you watched it or not if I had to. So far, I haven't looked over anybody's shoulder. Anyway, let's hop into the charts. I'm tired of hearing myself talk. I know you are too. All right. Uh, if you guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. What I'm going to do is do a quick overview of the overall market and then we'll take a look at some sector action and then we'll take a look at your favorite stocks all right first to appease phil let's take a look at the 50-day moving average s p 500 back above its 50-day moving average as of yesterday and so far as of today one of my favorite concepts, and it works with pick your favorite moving average. I did a lot of work with this with the 20-day exponential moving average. I fell in love with the 20-day EMA for some strange reason back in the 90s, and that's why I wrote the uh, – or that's what inspired me to write the 220 EMA breakout system, which you can find on the Internet now. You used to have to buy it for $1.95, but it's been out there so much, it's it's everywhere. Anyway, the concept that came out of that article was daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. And as long as the lows are greater than the moving average, as a general statement, you want to be long a market. If you get bored while you're in a trade that's going nowhere, okay, and you're feeling like micromanaging yourself out, just pick your moving average. Plot a 50-week moving average, okay? And notice how daylight would keep you in these major bull markets and major bear markets. Or you could also use my bow tie moving averages on a weekly basis and look at the major signals over the years, okay? Bear market, bull market, bear market, bull market, okay? Now, when we get a weekly signal down, will we get a bear market? I don't know. Last time we had one, we didn't quite get a bear market, although the Russell 2000 went down 18%. And as I often say, for all intents and purposes, the media defines a bear market as a 20% or more drop. So Russell, Russell 2000 was pretty much in the bear market last time this happened. Now, the S&P 500 had a little throwback in here, but it did drop. From the bow tie, let's measure down here. It dropped about, I think, 4% in total. So anyway, S&P 500, it tried to bow tie down on a daily, which it did, I think, yesterday or day before, day before. But now the moving averages are crossing back over. So that signal so far has, be, has become negated or is negated. Now, if we look at the recent high in here, we're only a half a percent away, less than a half percent, as we are right now, away from that all-time high. As I preach, you want to err on the side of longer-term trend. Well, Dave, why have you been so concerned about the markets lately? Well, it's lost some steam, and you can see that it's gone sideways most of the summer, and now it's trying to wake up again. So... I wouldn't rush out and buy a bunch of stocks right now, but I had I have stayed long as many as I could, meaning that I honored my stops and got knocked out of a few, but I still am in a few stocks. Even though the market looked a little iffy, especially just a few days ago or at least a week ago, right? Now, let's not start kissing each other just yet. As a trend follower, I sure would like to see some new highs in here let's take a look at the nasdaq nasdaq looking a little better technology seems to be on fire after what a little shakeout okay 
What's the market going to do? Well, it's going to do what it has to do to frustrate the most. It's going to do the obvious, follow that longer-term trend without, but first, it's going to have a big shakeout. So if we can close a little bit higher than where we are today, the NASDAQ will close at an all-time high. And this is why we didn't rush out and short a whole bunch of stocks. We were, we were kind of dusting off our shorts. We began looking for shorts. But I was waiting for a little further confirmation from the overall market and or something that looked like the mother ball setup, something that didn't have a whole lot of support below, something I thought could really implode. Now, this isn't necessarily all clear. We might just shoot up to all-time highs. Everybody might feel good, and then the market will tank, okay? But I sure would like to see all-time highs, especially since – if you go back two days, the market is unchanged since when? Since June, going back a couple of days, all right? Now, Russell 2000, bow tie down recently, triggered the bow tie. And I wouldn't claim that this is out of the, that it's out of the woods just yet, okay? I wouldn't get excited about the Russell until it banged out some new highs. The good news is... We got one hell of a base in here, okay? And if we can break out of this base, we have a very good launching point off of that base. Now, sector action has been pretty darn mixed up until recently. But you can see aluminium, as Phil says, is banging out new highs in here. Biotech has been coming back very nicely in here. As you can see, breaking out to new highs today. So that's a good thing, obviously. Computer software breaking out to new highs. So that's certainly a good thing. Now, as you can see, you go back a couple of days in some of these sectors, and it didn't look quite as hot, right? And this is why we take things one day at a time. And we don't just flip a switch. You'll, If you go in and look at the archives of my columns, you'll see a lot of times I'll have a little bull, bull um, bear switch literally like a electrical switch, a light switch, I'll have it flip, you know, from bull to bear. Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. It's flipping a switch, okay? You have to take things one day at a time. As a trend follower, as a preacher, you're going to be a little late when that trend finally does turn, and you're going to be wrong until it does turn, until it does begin to trend again. But the good news is semis are coming back to brand new high, so that's certainly – a good thing and there's been a few sectors that have weathered this last little storm we had really well such as or not many just one I'd say it was a uh, aerospace or defense there it is you see it kind of hung in there the whole time doing this little uh, debacle but there's some really big companies in here just a few big companies that are mostly driving this whole sector Yeah, uh, Street Sports, Rasky, and Connors also use a 20 email strategy called Holy Grail. Yeah, they were just looking for a, a pullback to the 20-day moving average. And I did the same thing, but I called it daylight pullbacks in one of my books. I forget which one. And and I published that more for for people looking to have something fairly quantifiable to trade as opposed to a system for me in and of itself. So let me put in a, a let me let me see if this stock works with it. And I think it's called um, I don't know if I put it in layman's or what, but if you look back here, you see how you have this daylight, and then you look for a pullback to the moving average. So real simple stuff. And let me zoom in on it for you. Yeah, Linda Rasky jokingly called that uh, pattern the um, the Holy Grail. But I think that, you know, maybe this is something I should be showing for someone who's just getting started in trading, trying to wrap their head around things. Not that I want to get you heavily involved in moving averages, because I would much prefer if you just looked at the chart. But what I wrote about is what I call daylight pullbacks. And you simply want to look for a significant amount of daylight. 
And it's probably not a bad idea to also notice the net net move and make sure percentage wise it has a decent move. And then look to get long that market after it comes down and test its moving average. OK, in other words, wait until it begins a rally and then you have upside daylight. So, yeah, that's a that's I'm glad you brought that up because maybe that's something that I need to say. OK, guys, you want to learn how to trade. This is the only pattern that we're going to trade. And then let's do this over the next three, four months. And follow it to a T. And if we could successfully do that, then we could start adding in more patterns. So I'm glad you brought that up. Appreciate that. IWM back above the 200. Um, yeah, again, nothing magical about moving averages, but they can help to keep you on the right side of the chart. So yeah, Russell 2000, good observation. Tagged the uh, tagged and went below the 200. Okay, now back above it. So far, so good there. You know me, I sure would like to see some new highs. Okay, um, transports, one area not looking so hot in here. And there's a few areas that still look a little dubious, or quite dubious. So I wouldn't rush. It's not time to rush out and kiss each other just yet, but certainly last couple of days we have seen some improvement. Um, you know, I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but I, I talked to a buddy of mine. Yesterday, he runs a lot of money. He's over in Houston, Texas. I was checking on him. Unfortunately, he's high and dry. But he was telling me, he says, living through it, he says, the media does not, hasn't gotten deep enough in, or I forget the, how he exactly made the point. But by being there, he said it's much worse than what you're seeing on TV. And I've lived through Katrina, so I think I have an idea what he's saying. The point he was making is that Houston's, I think, the third largest economy by cities in the United States or something like that. I don't know the exact math that he was explaining, but Houston would be like the ninth biggest state economy wise if it, if it were a state by in and of itself. So um, we don't know what the repercussions of that's going to be, but we don't have to worry about that. It's kind of interesting. Kind of, I was just literally reading about uh, Jesse Livermore shorted a railroad right before there was an earthquake. And the there was a very muted reaction to the earthquake, but as the news came in, more and more news came in, then it became a little bit more exacerbated. So uh, very interesting point on that. I'm wondering, uh, you know, not to confuse the issue with facts, but I wonder if there's another shoe to drop with, uh, with Harvey. But we'll see. And as a trend follower, we don't even have to think about it. We just have to wait and see. All right, uh, let's open up for individual stock questions. And while I'm doing that, just a little housekeeping. If um, I did receive an email or two this morning about not being able to get in, so uh, let me know how you guys were able to get in or if you had any trouble. Just shoot me an email on that, and uh, we'll, I'll deal with that after the show. All right, any questions on individual stocks? Quite a bunch today. I know I pontificated excessively. <laughs> VPG. Uh, yeah, volume is super duper light on this. Um, I think it's it's too thin to uh, trade. Even as a small private trader, I'd be very careful trading something this thin. You know, if it was an IPO, sometimes I make exceptions on IPOs. You'll see some IPOs in the list that are kind of uh, thin. And I'll personally trade them that are kind of thin sometimes. But the reason there is I think that there's volume that can possibly come into the market. Once a stock is long established like this, you got to be careful in trading these thin stocks. But I hear you. Um, yeah, I can't argue with it. I don't like this gap right here. I, I usually don't like a gap against the setup, but I think it looks okay. Um, I'd actually like to see more knockout, though, based on this move. So I think I'd pass based on the volume, based on the gap. And based on the fact that it really didn't pull back enough, maybe if it pulls back uh, a little bit more, maybe I'd be too much of a perfectionist. 
But I hear you. I can't argue with you too much on that one because it is a persistent uptrend. It has pulled back a little bit. Just for S and G's, let's throw the 20-day moving average in there and see what we get. Nope. See, you know, it's kind of interesting. Remember I said it, I think it needs to pull back a little more? Notice that it didn't quite get to the 20, okay? Now, this is one reason I don't trade things in a mechanical basis because I might like a pullback that doesn't get to the 20. But if you're newer to trading, I think that would probably be a good pattern to trade. Yeah, MBIO, long buy B. I'm long this one too. If you want to know what IPOs I'm long, sometimes just go and look at the ones that are closing at new highs. I'm probably long. <laughs> Some of them. I know somebody in service is going to say, why you didn't tell me? It's like, well, it doesn't really fit the, the core methodology. And in some cases, especially like this, it's too thin um, to trade. But, yeah, I think it looks okay. Um, I'd like to see some more upside follow through, obviously, but it is right at brand new highs. And keep in mind, as long as a, as long as a IPO stays at new highs, everyone is happy. And the reason you can't just buy a – regular old stock at new highs is because a lot of times you have people going back years and years and years that are looking to unload the stock and it has bad memories okay and if it's not at all time highs then it can be a little work because then let's say it's you might have a stock that is this it's making new highs in here you're feeling pretty good well, it could have some longer-term bad memories. But with an IPO, the slate is clean, okay? It doesn't have the long-term bad memories. Now, there are, it doesn't mean there's, there's not some people back here that own pre-market that are looking to get off the hook. But as long as it's headed higher, they're not going to be inclined to sell as fast. But, yeah, I agree with you on that one. Um And I guess technically, if it closes above this high, it would still be uh, a buy at B. It's also, if we put in my uh, my moving average system with the, the little breakaway, Dave Light breakaway, it would have triggered yesterday at this closing high, okay? So all you're looking for is the low greater than the moving average has to close at a new high if the first day of trading makes the all-time high, the high of the bar, then that's also close above that. Kona? Yeah, I kind of like this one. Uh, HV kind of crazy, 126. That's super-duper high, so there is a little danger in that. Um Tons and tons of overhead supply at $10. Okay, well, this creates a little bit of a dilemma. If the stock got to $10 a share, I think I'd be pretty happy. Um, but unfortunately, the more you kind of look at it, the more problems you begin to see. Well, lots of overhead supply at 6 Well, if it doubled in value, that would be okay, right? Well, you also have quite a bit around... Four, and you probably wouldn't be getting in till around here. So I'm going to rule that one out based on the amount of overhead supply. Now, I will agree with you in that it has made a pretty good run from lows, and it's its first little pullback, okay? So I find that kind of interesting. But also super-duper thin, too. So I'm going to go ahead and pass based on those reasons. GOGL, that's going to be a shipper, right? Some of these shippers are doing okay in here. Um, I did some research. Boy, I'm, it's been a while, though. Um, oh, maybe six years ago, seven years ago. I can't remember. But I was doing some studying of, of sectors to figure out what sectors trended the best, and shipping was one of the absolute worst sectors to trend and it tends to chop around a lot education was another one that was really bad um so what i would encourage you to do in those particular sectors is just make sure you're picking picking the best of the best of the best um 
I would prefer if this one would clear its prior highs a little bit better. Maybe get up to about 11 bucks a share or so and then pull back. I don't like the fact that it's just barely getting past this peak in here. That's an okay pattern when you're coming off of all-time lows like down here, like a cup and handle. But I don't like it as much at higher levels. So I would pass based on that. Okay. Any more? Yeah, China Cord CO. Um, this is one I've been watching for a while. Just for SNGs, let's throw a 20 in there. Almost, yeah. Well, what I was getting ready to say is I'd almost want to see a little bit deeper pullback. And it's kind of interesting is the 20 day EMA might not be a bad litmus test for that. I do like the way that it has begun to accelerate higher. It's obviously had a pretty good run in here, up 300% uh, or more. But it actually still looks pretty interesting. I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout. But definitely put this one on your watch list. I, I mean, if you bought this stock, let's say somewhere in here, maybe at 14 or so, I, I certainly couldn't fault you from doing that because – you're trading with a persistent trend. You're trading a pullback. You're trading a, a trend that has trend qualifiers, such as a gap in the direction of the trend. Notice a strong close here. Okay. All these concepts, believe it or not, are in the first four free videos, not to pimp it, but it's free. Okay. The first four free videos of trading full circle. So based on those things, uh, yes. But I personally would like a little bit more of a knockout move anymore we're only got a few minutes left i know i've pontificated quite a bit there's not enough hours in the day right now currently i don't know if it'll always be here but currently the free videos are here on the trading full circle so if you just go to my home page and then it's going to be a second slot down. TGB. And one more after that. TGB, covered handle on a weekly, but approaching resistance. Um, well, it's not a cup and handle because you don't have a handle. I hear what you're saying. Maybe it's a cup and handle back here. Um, yeah, that's a resistance we talked about, obviously, a while back. So, yeah, it's a little too late in this one. These mining companies, I prefer them coming off of major lows as opposed to higher levels. But if they get gone, then we're just left with stocks, stocks at higher levels, and that's what we trade. All right. I think uh, I think we're, we're out of time. Uh, obviously, I want to thank everybody for coming. appreciate you guys and girls taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. We'll have to look into that link problem, see why, um, what's going on there. And I promise I'll do that. Any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Lander.com recording will be ready in about two hours. So if you can't sleep tonight, uh, you can <laughs> pull that up. Anyway, everybody have a fantastic uh, Labor Day weekend. If we don't talk between now and then, and uh, hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls next week, and we'll get the links to stuff fixed. Thank you so much.